What is up everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. This is my betting breakdown video for UFC Vegas 61. We have Mackenzie Dern going against Yan Jaonan. And we are back for another betting breakdown video this week, breaking down a 12-fight card. We were supposed to have 13 fights, but we did, unfortunately, lose the Tabitha Ricci jessica Penny fight. Um, luckily for me, I did not have any action on that fight, kind of a fight I was going to sit back and watch, but I was looking forward to watching it. But yeah, still 12 fights. Um, this is a card where I don't think there is the most name value in the world, and I see a lot of people crapping on the card, but hey, listen, I mean... We have some fights this Saturday. Last Saturday, we had no fights. It kind of sucked. Next Saturday, we don't have any fights. It's going to suck. So, I mean, any card is better than no card for me. So, I'm looking forward to it. And I actually think there's going to be some really fun fights on this card. I have a couple bets we'll talk about, a couple spots that are sticking out. Um, so, yeah, I can't wait to break it down again to it. Before we do so, guys, if you guys can please leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Um, did a live stream on Friday. If you have not checked that out, go check that out. And then I'll be doing a live stream on fight day for, uh, for best bet. For the card as well so make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss out on all that other stuff all right um i say we get right into it here have uh, quite a few things to talk about and we'll start with the first fight of the card we have randy costa going against guido canetti here um, we have randy costa as a pretty big favorite at minus 300 guido canetti um plus 250 and this is a fight where i would not um touch the randy costa money line i think he should win this fight i think it's kind of a setup fight for Randy Costa, he's so much younger than Guido Canetti. Uh, Canetti, 42 years old, not only 42 years old, but 42 years old at, at Bantamweight. And we'll actually talk about two other fighters that are older than Guido Canetti, but those fighters are fighting at, you know, 170 in, in heavyweight. So, you know, they can maybe get away with it a little bit more than Guido Canetti, but um, yeah, Guido Canetti went out there and got a, a nice win in his last fight against Chris Moutinho, but I can tell you right now, Randy Costa is not Chris Moutinho. You know, Randy Costa should win this fight. The only reason I cannot get to that money line is because uh, Randy Costa kind of falls off a cliff once that fight hits the second round. Um, he's 0-3 in fights that have actually went over one half of a round, two minutes and 30 seconds. He's 0-3, um, been finished in three of his losses, all three in the second round. So if this fight does get extended, like, Kennedy's going to be super live, and maybe this is a fight you can look at from a live betting standpoint. But I think violence is the answer here. I think uh, a lot of people are on that under 1.5. I think the under one and a half is good, especially earlier in the week. It has been smashed throughout the week, and you know, rightfully so with how these guys fight. Um, I'm personally on the fight doesn't go to decision in a parlay piece. As a parlay piece, we'll talk about the other parlay piece later down the card, but I like violence here. I think anything violence is the way to go. Um, but yeah, give me this fight to end inside the distance as a parlay piece there to kick off the card. All right, next we have Chelsea Chandler going against uh, Julio Stoliorenko. We have Chandler, who is minus 105, Sully Ranko minus 115, kind of a pick him here. And yeah, I was pretty impressed with Chelsea Chandler. I really like the power in her hands. Went and watched um, a couple of her fights, and you know, each and every one of her fights, she's she's dropping fighters hard. Like, her power um, is very impressive, and maybe she's able to go out there and have success against Holia Stelyarenko, who kind of blocks punches with her face with that 44% strike and defense. So yeah, on the feet, I think Chandler can have a lot of success and maybe even hurt uh, Stelyarenko. But you know, the thing with Chandler and Every single one of her fights, for the most part. I mean, they're, they're touching the mat. And she's a good grappler in her own right, but, you know, what is Stoliarenko good at? And it's really only one thing, and that one thing is her grappling. She's a very, very dangerous grappler, a 90% finish rate, all nine of those wins by submission. I believe nine of those wins by armbar. If, it, if this fight hits the mat, there's a good chance Stoliarenko does get that sub. So, um, I like a couple spots here. The, the bet I do have is on the violence. Uh, I have a half a unit on the fight doesn't go the distance at plus 130. That line's still there. Um, and then also taking a hard look at that Stoliarenko by sub line at plus 300 um, around there, plus 275, plus 300 for Stoliarenko. Like that is literally her win condition. She does not win any other way outside of an arm bar. So if you like Stoliarenko, you probably bet the sub. But yeah, give me violence here. Give me both sides. I think Chandler, she's a good grappler in her own right. And she has like a ton of power in her hands. The power that she possess possesses is very impressive to me. So uh, I think somebody's getting finished here. As far as a pick, I'll go Sully Aranko, but give me the violence there. Half a unit fight doesn't go plus 130. All right, next we have Maxime Grishin going against Philippe Lenz. I have a small bet here on Grishin. Uh, one unit at minus 175. I've been kind of hovering around the, the trigger all week. I decided to finally pull the trigger there at minus 175. And the reason being, I think it's a really good matchup for Maxime Grishin. And I don't think this is going to be the most exciting fight in the world. Um, but I do think it's a good matchup for him. So 
If Philippe Lenz comes in here and strikes with Maxime Grishin for 15 minutes, I think Maxime Grishin is going to look like a huge favorite here, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think Philippe Lenz is going to come in here and try to grapple uh, Maxime Grishin. He, he said that in an interview as well that he's going to go in there, he's going to use his BJJ against Maxime Grishin, and that's good, and maybe he has success early. It's just I don't believe that Philippe Lenz can implement a wrestling-heavy game plan for 15 minutes. I don't think he has the cardio to do so. So um, I think Maxime Grishin... May get, even get taken down a couple times, but I think he pops right back up. He's fought in much better guys than Philippe Lenz, much bigger guys than Philippe Lenz as well. And Maxim Grishin, the guy that has fought at light heavyweight the majority of his career, um, is the bigger guy in this matchup compared to Lenz, who has fought at heavyweight for the majority of his career. But yeah, Grishin's much, much bigger. He's a huge, huge light heavyweight. So I think he'll have no problem stuffing the takedowns. If he gets taken down, get back up. And as the fight goes on, like Philippe Lenz, his cardio is, is horrible. We saw in his last fight against Procnia, um, cardio fell off a cliff, but luckily for him, you know, Procnia was, was gassed six minutes in. So um, outside of like, I don't know, like a Philippe Lenz early knockout or like a Philippe Lenz early sub, which I think both are very unlikely. I think it's a, a good fight for Grishin here, but um, you just don't want to go too heavy on it because it's, it's Maxime Grishin and it's a guy that um, he's not too impressive, but I think stylistic is a very winnable matchup for him. So give me a unit on Maxime Grishin. Should be an interesting fight. All right, next we have Christoph Jocko going against Brendan Allen. And yeah, this is a very interesting fight for me because we have a guy in Christoph Jaku who has some of the best fight IQ in the entire UFC. And then we have a guy in Brendan Allen who has some of the worst, if not the worst, fight IQ I've ever seen in my life. The guy just continues to make mistakes. When you expect him to grapple, he'll strike. When you expect him to strike, he'll grapple. I mean, he, just does, he does everything wrong. So, And he's a good fighter. He's a very good fighter. He's young. He's a very dangerous black belt. Very good grappler. Just does not use it, especially as of late. Kind of fell in love with his hands. And if he does that here against Jocko, I think for one, it's probably going to be very close on the feet. Allen striking hasn't proved a ton, but Allen's striking defense is, is not good. Uh, Allen's striking defense is 44%. Um, that's the same striking defense as Julio Stolyarenko. So he's kind of like a walking punching bag there, whereas Jocko... He may not be the, the most exciting fighter, and like I was saying throughout the week, like I can't find one person who's, who's a Jocko fan, because how can he be a fan of this guy with the way he fights? He's a very boring fighter, and this is going to be a very boring fight, but what he does very well is use that fight IQ, and he, and he wins minutes. He's going to make this a slow-paced, boring fight, and that's going to favor him. He's very good at you know not getting into wars, not getting into exchanges, so... I feel like his striking defense is much better as well. So yeah, on the feet, it's going to be Allen who probably is landing harder. But you know, Jocko's going to hit Allen with everything he throws. And then on top of that, you know, I think a lot of people are expecting Allen to grapple here. For one, he's not probably going to do that for because his fight IQ is horrible. And then for two, if he even tries to, Jocko has elite takedown defense, a good get up game, and Jocko's a black belt himself. And we saw him show off that grappling and those takedowns against Gerald Mearshart in his last fight. And I feel like that is a clear path to victory here as well for Jocko. Take this fight down to the mat. Win minutes on the mat if you don't like how it's going on the feet. We saw Jocko has the ability to do that. And Brendan Allen cannot stuff a takedown. So I think it's a really, really good matchup for Christoph Jocko. The only problem is it's Christoph Jocko. How can you be confident in this guy? But I do have a half a unit on Christo Christoph Jocko to win by decision. And I got that at plus 155. And I actually see that at plus 160 out there right now. So, yeah, if you, if you like Jockey, you like him by decision. I mean, this guy has the worst finish rate on the entire card. I mean, it's 29% finish rate for Christoph Jocko. So, you like Jocko, you like him by decision. I like him by decision. Half a unit, plus 155. What I also did, and I will hit one of these eventually. I bet this like two or three times at this point. Um, I have the split decision here on DraftKings Sportsbook. They have it at plus 450, which is interesting because I see this fight is going to play out close. Um, this fight is heavily favored to go the distance. I think it's like minus 180, minus 190 to go the distance. And you never know what these judges, right? Like Adela Bird, I she, I think she's blind in both of her eyes. You know, maybe she's not watching the fight. You know, Chris Lee's probably taking a nap. And both, all three judges probably fall asleep because this is a Christoph Jocko fight. Like you, you never know what these scores are going to be. Like, are they going to score the point fighting of Jocko? Or are they going to score, you know, the harder shots of Brennan Allen? Um, I don't know. So I think the split is like super live here um, if this does go to decision. So I took a quarter unit shot on it, plus 450. But I, I really do believe that this is a very winnable fight for Christoph Jocko here. All right, next we have Joaquim Silva going against Jesse Ronson. And um, yeah, a lot of people like the violence here, and I am, am one of those uh, a lot of people. So I, 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 I found this interesting way to play this fight. So if you have both DraftKings and FanDuel, um, so DraftKings has the fight to end by knockout at plus 300, 
And then on FanDuel, um, they have the fight to end by sub at plus 320, which, you know, huge differences in, in those lines there. Um, so I put 0 0.75 units on each. So if the fight ends by knockout, I'll hit that. And the fight ends by sub, I'll hit that. And those are like pretty juicy odds. And honestly, what I was going to do just originally was just bet the fight to end by KO. I'll kind of talk about why, but once I saw the fight ends by sub on Fandle, plus 320, I figured I'd just play them both, and if the fight does end inside the distance, it'll be a nice profit there, but if you don't have access to that, I do recommend, like, the under 2.5, the fight doesn't get the decision. I think this is a very violent fight. So the reason I did like that fight ends in KO, though, is because Joaquin Silva, you know, his nickname's Neto BJJ, um, phenomenal grappler, um, it just doesn't use it at all. Um, um, Silva, one takedown on the UFC, his last submission comes in 2014, so I just don't think he's going to use that path to victory. But my goodness, if, if he does, if he fights smart, if he gets his fight down to the mat, it's an easy night at the office for Joaquin Silva. It's just I can't trust him to do that. He likes to go out there and stand and bang, and I think that's exactly what he's going to do. And if he does that, his chin's horrible. I think Ronson probably knocks him out. So I'm leaning the Ronson knockout. But yeah, hey, if Silva wants to grapple and wants to get this fight down to the mat, he's, he's going to submit Jesse Ronson. So I guess it just comes down to the game plan of Silva here. But yeah, I think the fight doesn't go as a great look. The under two and a half is a great look. Violence is a great look. The fight ends by KO is not a bad look. But yeah, I did put 0 0.75 units on the fight ends in KO at plus 300. And then 0 0.75 units on the fight ends by sub at uh, plus 320. Hoping at least one of those hits and we get a finish here. Next, we have the 1-800-GAMBLER fight of the week. We have Alexi Olenek going against Alir Latifi. Um... Man, I, I don't want to bet this fight, and I'm not going to. I think the responsible thing to do here is just, just pass. But I am, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't tempted on an old man at Linux, 45 years old. He's got to be the, the oldest fighter on the roster at this point. But I don't know. The, the problem with me for this fight is I can see this fight playing out so many different ways. I can see a Latifi knockout. I could see a Latifi lay and pray decision. I could see an Olenek decision on the feet just doing more. You know, Latifi does nothing in his fights. I could see an Olenek, like, I can see this fight playing out so many different ways. So I think it's it's a pass. Um, if anything, it's a dogger pass with the, the Olenek side. But do I want to bet on a 45-year-old Olenek? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth the, the, the stress of, of watching this fight? Because this is going to be a, I don't know, it's going to be a weird fight in every single Alexi Olenek fight. It's just super weird. So, I mean, I, I'm passing here. Uh, the pick's Olenek, but I'm just not comfortable with laying any type of money on this one next we have mike davis going against slava borshev and originally earlier in the week i thought i would be betting borshev here but after digging into the tape and went and watched every single fight i could of mike davis i do like the davis side um because he goes for a lot of takedowns um outside the ufc especially he's going for these takedowns and i guess the one thing with davis is his control's not great um his grappling's pretty solid but his control's not great his opponents are oftentimes allowed to, or able to just pop right back up and i do think that's going to be a lot of the case in this matchup here, but my thinking is like on the feet, it's going to be pretty close. Um, but I think it's going to be Davis that has the ability to mix in the takedown. So if it's a close round, Davis is going to, you know, get a takedown or two to kind of seal off that round there. And if Davis really wants to make this look, you know, kind of fairly easy here, I mean, just mix in a bunch of takedowns, wrestle for 15 minutes consistently because Borshev has some of the worst takedown defense you'll ever see. And like I said, Mike Davis is wrestling is very impressive. So, I mean, Davis has the path to victory there. Am I going to lay minus 190 on him? No, I'm not because I don't really trust him to go out there and wrestle consistently for, for 15 minutes shooting, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 takedowns. I think he'll shoot a couple and get a couple, but I do expect this to be a close-ish fight. But I do like the takedowns and the takedown upside of Mike Davis here to get the job done. But no bet on this one for me. Uh, next, we have Don Castaneda going against Daniel Santos. I do have two bets here. Most importantly, I do like this over two and a half rounds. Um, both guys are very, very durable. Seven losses combined. Only one was inside the distance. John Castaneda got knocked out. I want to say back in like early in his career, like 2013, 2014. It was a long time ago. But yeah, John Castaneda is super tough, and especially Daniel Santos. Daniel Santos has very good toughness, very good chin. And as far as this fight plays out, I think it's another very close fight. I like the pressure of Daniel Santos. He's going to be coming forward the entire time. We saw Eddie Wineland, of all people, have success pressuring John Castaneda. And I kind of see the fight playing out a little bit like that. And, of course, John Castaneda was able to catch an old Eddie Wineland. Um, but I think Daniel Santos is going to come forward. He's going to make Castaneda uncomfortable here. And he's going to land a ton of volume. I think people are really crapping on Santos for his first performance in the UFC. I don't think we saw the best version of him that night. Because you go and watch this guy outside the UFC. He's very good. Um, but yeah, I think whoever comes forward in this fight is going to have the success, and I kind of think it's Santos, but 
Um, I think the over is a really good look. But like I said, both these guys, next level toughness. And then I also saw a line that stuck out, and that was the scorecards equals no action. The finish only for uh, Daniel Santos on DraftKings Sportsbook at plus 150. I don't think there's a finish in this fight, but if there's a finish in this fight, I, I think it's going to be the Santos side, honestly. I think that line should be closer to a pick -em. Santos is extremely dangerous, has that spinning back kick to the body. Um, and like I said, John Castaneda has been knocked out before. Daniel Santos never been knocked out. So uh, I do expect this to go the distance, but if there's a finish, I kind of feel like it's more likely on the Santos side, honestly. So I did take a half unit shot there on the Santos scorecards equals no action at plus 150, but I do think this fight goes the distance more often than not. And I am on that over two and a half, over two and a half, a minus 155 for one unit. So I uh, like the over. Um, don't mind the dog shot on Santos as well at plus 160 around there. Um, but you give me the over, give me that scorecards, no action on, on Santos here. Next, we have Sadiq Yusuf going against Don Shanus. Um, not much to talk about here. Yusuf's a minus 1100. You can't do much there. I don't really want anything to do with the props. Was thinking maybe about the fight doesn't go, but they're all over it and more minus 220. I'm okay on that. Um, yeah, nothing sticking out. I mean, what do you want me to say? Like, Yusuf is going going to win this fight. The odds heavily do favor that. I think Shane is going to have some success here or there. I'd caution anyone parlaying Yusuf because it doesn't really add much to your parlay. And on top of that, Don Shanus is, is not a bum. It's getting priced like he's a bum, but it's actually pretty impressed with Don Shanus. But, um, yeah, Yusuf just going to have a massive, massive advantage in the striking. Maybe Shanus can mix in takedowns here or there, make it competitive at times. But I think Yusuf eventually knocks out Don Shanus, but you don't want to lay minus 180 on the knockout prop, minus 210 on the inside of the distance for Yusuf. Um, it's not something you really want to do. But, yeah, Yusuf, Yusuf is going to win more than likely. Um, but I just not, not a parlay piece for me, nothing like that. All right, next we have an interesting fight. So, Hani Barcelo is going against Trevin Jones. This is a fight that, the very first fight I taped, and I think it's a really good buy low spot on Hani Barcelo. Uh, Barcelo's were used to getting this guy at, he's like minus 450 in his last fight. He was a big favorite against Tamir Valiev, huge favorite against Taha. He was a, a pick him against Syed Nurmagomedov. I mean, this is a guy that we're, we're usually paying a ton for Barcelos, but he's on a two fight skid here. I think a lot of people are very down on him. And yeah, after taping this fight, I, I love Barcelos in this spot. Um, I do have a couple concerns and we'll get to those, but as far as this fight plays out stylistically, like Barcelos is better in every single aspect of MMA outside of age and outside of power. And even then I think Barcelos has a lot of power in his own right, but you know, clearly Trevin Jones hits like an absolute truck. Um, but yeah, on the feet, it's going to be Barcelos with the pressure. We see Trevin Jones backing up, not throwing a ton of volume, whereas Barcelos is going to be, you know, outlanding Trevin Jones two to one, maybe three to one, just so much more volume, uh, so much more tools on the feet. Whereas Trevin Jones, he's going to back up, he's going to load up, and he's going to swing hard and try to take off Barcelos' head. And maybe he can knock out Barcelos. Barcelos has never been knocked out, never been knocked down, but he is 35 years old on a two fight skid, ate a lot of shots against Victor Henry. And that's another thing. I think people are really down on. Uh, that loss against Victor Henry, but Victor Henry threw like 400 strike attempts. You know, Trevin Jones, I don't think his entire career he's thrown 400 strike attempts. It's just not something Trevin Jones does or can do. He's not a volume guy. He's a, he's a power puncher. So, yeah, I like Barcelos here quite a bit. I think if this fight hits the mat, it's going to be Barcelos getting on top. Barcelos like a 90% takedown defense. Um, Trevin Jones like a 12% takedown accuracy. So, yeah, I think Barcelos has him covered everywhere. It's just something, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting a really bad feeling about this fight. Um... And then on top of that, I saw the weigh-ins today, and Barcelos did not look good to me. He looked he looked kind of old. He looked very, very sucked out. And I don't know, I just have a bad feeling about this one. But yeah, Barcelos was the very first bet I placed. I, play, I placed it last Friday. I have two units on him at minus 196. So yeah, I beat the line quite a bit. Um, but after seeing the weigh-ins, I think I'm going to take a quarter unit shot on the Trevin Jones by knockout for a couple of reasons. For one, I have that bad feeling in the back of my head. I, I don't typically hedge out like this. Uh, I think I've done it just a handful full of time, handful of times. Um, but two, that bad or two, for one, the bad feeling. Two, um, you know, he is 35 years old at this point. And then three, the weigh-ins just that was kind of the last thing that scares me a, a little bit here. And on top of that, let's be honest, like the, the Jones knockout prop is is mispriced here. It's it's plus 600. So um, I think I'm gonna put a quarter unit on that Jones knockout prop just to hedge off a little bit of Barcelos. I think Barcelos still wins this fight, but Jones hits hard. Barcelos is getting old. I do not like the weigh-ins. I think Barcelos should win this fight, but I don't know. I just have a bad feeling about this one. So I have the two-unit bet on Barcelos, um, minus 196, and then going to hedge off a quarter unit um, on that knockout prop at plus 600. And if you do like Jones, you should be all over that plus 600 by knockout. Like, that's literally how he wins. He's not going to sub 
um, Barcelos, and he's not going to win a decision against Barcelos, at least in my opinion. So, um, yeah, that's how I'm playing the fight. Just a weird one, but I just have a weird feeling about this fight. Next, we have Randy Brown going against Francisco Trinaldo. Uh, we have Randy Brown, minus 330, Trinaldo, plus 270. This is going to close out my parlay. It's my biggest play of the night. I have two and a half units on a parlay here. Randy Brown parlayed with the fight doesn't go in the cost of Kennedy fight. Um, came out to minus 117. Both those lines have kind of been smashed throughout the week, especially the fight doesn't go in the cost of Kennedy fight. But um, I was just trying to figure out, you know, what am I going to parlay with Randy Brown? Because I really like Randy Brown. He really stuck out to me. And I ended up parlaying him up with that fight doesn't go in the cost of Kennedy fight. Two of my favorite spots in the card and into one parlay. And it will be my biggest play of the night there. A lot of my night will come down to these two spots. But as far as the fight goes, Randy Brown... Um, he's just much younger, much younger and much bigger. If you guys saw the weigh-ins, he was towering over Francisco Trinaldo, and Trinaldo's a guy that is looking small in there against guys like Danny Roberts, guys like Muslim Salikov. Um, can't imagine what Brandy Brown's going to look like against Francis, uh, Francisco Trinaldo. And on top of that, he's struggling with guys like Dwight Grant. Um, and, and yeah, he beat Danny Roberts, but like that's Danny Roberts. I think it's a big step of competition from the guys that Toronto has been facing, like the Jai Herberts, the Danny Roberts, the Dwight Grants. Like Randy Brown beats all those guys. So um, I like Randy Brown here. Um, no hot take for me. I have him in a parlay. I don't want to really mess around with the props because I can see Brown winning by decision or knockout. I'm more so leaning the decision, but uh, give me Randy Brown as a parlay piece. And then finally, the main event, uh, Mackenzie Dern, Yan Zhao Nan. Nothing here for me. I mean, what stuck out initially was the Mackenzie Dern inside the distance was hoping for plus money. Uh, not going to get it. Uh, it's minus 140, minus 150. Then was hoping for maybe plus money on the sub prop. Eh, not going to get it. It's minus 110, minus 120 for the sub prop. So I'm just going to sit back and watch and, you know, I'm, I don't know, watch this fight and enjoy it. Um, Mackenzie Dern needs one takedown, needs the fight to hit the mat one time, and the fight will be over shortly after. Am I going to lay minus 230 on Mackenzie Dern, who can't wrestle? <laughs> no, I am not. But I do think it only is going to take one. One back take. You know, if she's able to pull guard, and if she's able to get that takedown, I think the fight will be over shortly after. So the only way I could look at playing this fight would be Dern by sub. Or if you like Yan Zhao Nan, maybe the money line could be something to look at. But I saw on DraftKings Sportsbook they have the decision only for Yan Zhao Nan. I think like minus 135. Like if this fight goes to distance, I heavily favor Yan Zhao Nan. I don't see Mackenzie Dern going out there and winning minutes on the feet or winning minutes really on the mat because I think if this fight hits the mat, it's a sub. So Yan Zhao Nan decision only. Dern by sub. Dern inside the distance. Those are always I look at playing this fight, but I do not have a bet on it. All right, so we'll quickly go over my action here. It's a sketchy card. I, 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 would, I would tread very lightly. Just sketchy really all around, but I have two units on Heine Barcelos. A uh, minus 196 going to hedge out a, a tad on that quarter unit knockout prop for Jones at plus 600. We'll see what happens there. We'll see if the uh, the feeling in the back of my um, head was correct there. And then I have one unit on Maxime Grishin, minus 175 against Philippe Linz. I have the two and a half unit parlay. Randy Brown parlayed with the Costa Kennedy fight doesn't go, minus 117. A half a unit on Stoli Aranko Chandler fight doesn't go, plus 130. I have the Jocko by decision, plus 155, half a unit. The split decision in the Brendan Allen Jocko fight on DraftKings, quarter unit, plus 450. I have the fight ends it by knockout in the Ronson Silva fight, 0.75 units, plus 300. And then the fight ends by submission, Ronson Silva fight, plus 320, 0.75 units. I'm looking for a finish in that fight. If you don't have access to both DraftKings and Fando, I'd play the under or fight doesn't go. Um, the over 2.5 in the Castaneda Santos fight, minus 155 on unit. And then the scorecards equals no action for Daniel Santos, uh, plus 150, half a unit. And that is about it. So we'll see what happens. Sketchy card, like I said, but should be a fun card. So looking forward to it. Leave a like on your way out, guys. Subscribe to the channel. Go check out the live stream, uh, the one on Friday, and then the one on Saturday for best bet. Uh, check me out on Twitter, DFS underscore numbers, Instagram, DFS by the numbers. And let us make some money for UFC Vegas 61. Good luck, guys, with all your plays.